but my name is Josh Kelly and I work for Vermont DEC um, and in the solid waste program. I'm the materials management section chief. M uh, many of you know me, some of you don't, um, but I'm really excited that we have 32 people um, on this this sort of virtual discussion video meet. Um, I, I would call it a webinar, except it's not really a webinar. It's more of a discussion. Um, and as many of you know, we've we've passed the July 1 uh, landfill or disposal ban on food waste um, and food scraps. And, and many of you are operating transfer stations or other facilities that collect and uh, collect food scraps. Some of you even run composting facilities that compost it. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of work and it's um, becoming a lot of material. And so we had questions coming into our office and I thought it would be helpful to just learn from all of the collective knowledge out there um, from both facilities that are managing materials and including food scrap haulers who are starting to, um, I mean, many of them are collecting in different ways. Some use dumpsters, some use totes, um, some um, provide cleaning services. There, there are all kinds of um, ways of doing this uh, collection activity. And so I thought we might just kind of call on the collective wisdom of everybody to learn from each other. So my goals today are to discuss best management practices around uh, food waste collection and food waste management um, with a specific lens about uh, transfer stations and collection um, sites. I believe there will probably be some discussion. I anticipate people talking about on-site composting um, because I have heard people bring that up in other meetings. Um, we probably don't have time today to get into all of that, um, but we could probably touch on it briefly. Um, so I'm going to, I'm getting, every once in a while I get bad network quality, so Emma can just, can just jump in if I'm garbled. Um, I really would like to turn this over to a few key folks to kick off the discussion today, um, really to share their experience collecting food waste in their regions um, as a way to sort of seed the discussion. And then after that, what I'd like to do is have people either raise their hands or put a question in the chat. And Emma and I will um, uh, look at questions in the chat and I'll try and call on you um, if I see a hand raise. And Emma, please nudge me if you see that I miss somebody. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce John Letty, um, who's with the Northwest Solid Waste District. He's the general manager um, from the really the Georgia area of Vermont, but much broader than that, uh, Franklin and Grand Isle counties. John, you want to start? Hi. Yep. Thanks, Josh. Um, yes, the, I'm the director of the Northwest Solid Waste District, and our offices are located in Georgia as well as a uh, um, our main collection facility. Uh, we operate five drop off centers for trash recycling, food scraps and other waste items. Um, and we have been collecting food scraps at our five drop off centers for about five years now. Um, then we in the past three years have added uh, uh, one drop off site that is at the St. Albans Co-op, uh, which is the, the co-op store. Um, it's located at the Creamery, it's sort of a small uh, farm garden supply store. Uh, and we have a drop off point at that is at our compost facility or at the Hudak Farm, which is our partnering facility. Um, so there are seven total food scrap drop off points for the public within the Northwest Solid Waste District. Um, and we collect all the food scraps in totes at those points, uh, 32 gallon totes. We service them with our own trucks um, as part of our greater food scrap collection program. We collect food scraps from businesses and institutions uh, ranging from the hospital, uh, medical center, the prison to small realtor agent uh, offices and uh, restaurants. So a real range of businesses and institutions. Um, and our drop off points are in that uh, route that we use to pick up food scraps. Um, as Jet, we were talking about, and we've all heard uh, the demand for drop off 
food scrap collection is uh, through the roof. Uh, we've seen uh, a tripling of the volume of food scraps at our drop off sites. Uh, and the largest is our Georgia facility uh, of our dro the drop off sites. The solid waste district runs. Uh, we average uh, 13 totes a week, 13 of our 32 gallon totes per week of food scraps, and that's up from about six uh, previously before uh, July, we'll say. Um, the two drop off points that are actually at private locations um, at the St. Albans Co-op and at the Hudak Farm both collect more food scraps than our actual drop off points. Uh, the co-op is at about 16 and it averages 16 totes per week. Again, that's a 32 gallon tote. And uh, the Hudak farm in the last uh, fiscal quarter, so October through December uh, of the year, collected 42 totes a week. Um, that's a ridiculous increase. Uh, and there's a, a loyal customer base and he's really close to St. Albans City. So it makes it a real attractive spot for folks. Um, but that 42 totes per week at that site. Uh, so we've managed all those for best practices. You know, uh, one of the things that I was asked to touch on is keeping, uh, you know, sort of the ick factor down for folks who are using our sites. And uh, sawdust is the key to our uh, success. Um, in the summer, we make sure that there's a giant tote of sawdust next to the food scraps, and that if the customers aren't frequently coating the top of the tote with sawdust, that our staff does. Um, and we're certain that at the end of each operating day, we've got like three inches of sawdust on the top of the tote. Because of a, you can limit flies access to the surface area, then you can limit um, the number of eggs they can lay and the number of maggots and whatnot. Um, and we found two, you know, 32 gallon totes. The reason we use them, one, they're easy to manage for our staff. They're easy to roll, they're easy to move, uh, and they're easy to tip once we get them back to the compost facility. Um, but also, uh, they are, um, it's a manage, we have to manage them frequently. So a smaller container, you can't leave too long. You can't um, leave unnoticed. So it won't get as, uh, it won't sit for days on end without being attended to, uh, and therefore won't have as many of the problems uh, as you could find. You know, uh, some other folks have talked about dumpsters. Uh, it's efficient to move food scraps in dumpsters. It's an e efficient to collect them, but uh, if you want to say, let food scraps sit for longer than a week, you're bound to have odor problems, leachate and uh, smell. So having totes, we have to service our totes weekly and that helps keep moving them through and helps keep them from becoming a, a nuisance. Uh, so that's really the reason that we've stuck with uh, a smaller tote size. One of the reasons. Um, Great. Yeah. John, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Any, any last thoughts there or did, I, did we pretty much capture most of it? That pretty much caps. Uh, Critters was the last one that I oh, did. Oh, right. On. Yeah. And um, we have not had any bear issues. Um, even we have sites in Montgomery and Bakersfield. Uh, and those sites have not had any uh, large animal issues. Uh, where we have had animal issues, it's been raccoons. And um, that's we know that because we've seen them. And that was here at the Georgia facility where staff come in in the morning and uh, raccoons were clamoring out of the food scrap tote. So uh, uh, a bungee cord to, you know, fasten to keep the, the lid shut. That was our solution to that, and um, it seemed to solve the problem until they learned, and raccoons will learn. So, <laughs> great. Well, thank you, John. Um, and and 
Um, I guess one of the one of the other reasons I'm, I wanted to hold this virtual call is that um, as as facilities started to go from a few totes of food waste and collecting food scraps to to many more, as we heard from John, um, there's this open question about how to do it best. So that that's all I'm looking at is trying to um, share the best practices from these different facilities and facility managers. And it's possible we might we might be able to create some guidance on on really best practices. Um, so I'd like to go to Esther Fishman next. Um, Esther, are you around? And we, we'll be doing some screen sharing um, with some photos. I am here. Um, I am uh, the recycling coordinator, and I manage one transfer station that serves five towns in southern Vermont. Our population grows from about 3,000 to over 5,000 in uh, several seasons. We have downhill, two downhill ski areas, two cross-country ski areas, the oldest summer theater, and a lot of other things that attract second homeowners and tourists. Uh, we serve mostly at our transfer station for food scrap collection, mostly residential, people, but we have a few commercial entities that come and use the facility as well. In January of 2020, we collected about 7,500 pounds of food scraps in eight 64-gallon totes with a collection of one time a week. And then the uh, scraps are transported to the Bennington compost facility. We um, then went to January 2021 and we collected 12,500 pounds of food scraps in one week uh, in three 64 gallon totes, two 48 gallon totes and 16 32 gallon totes a week. So that was about a 40% increase. The room in the bay where we store the totes was becoming extremely limited and we started to consider alternatives. We looked into the bio bin, uh, plus the cost of the blower, plus the haul cost and the labor at the site. Uh, we found that the product is not a finished compost, but a more compact product. So there'd be less hauls and haul costs, but you still need to add browns and maintain somewhat of a balance. So we looked at a couple of other options and there are a couple of slides that Emma has. Um, Are you seeing them? I am seeing the main one, yes. If okay. you the first one. Let's see, there we go. So this is a, it's actually a 14 uh, cubic yard wet material roll off. And the uh, beauty of this thing is that the top slides closed but in using something like this, we would also need to have a tote tipper. I think there's a picture of it on the next slide. Um, so the idea was for our residents to for it to be easy for them and they would put their food waste into the totes. We keep, I don't know, two or three around when those got full, the attendants would be able to roll the totes over to this tote tipper. The 15 yard compactor would be, it's not a compactor, the container would be opened, totes would be tipped in, closed again uh, to keep the odors down. And it was a good seal and it was made for wet material. Um, that was one option. The other option we were exploring because we had a local company uh, approach us about using uh, our materials for green material in their facility where they they grind wood and would be selling it as mulch and to make that happen a little quicker they thought adding the food scraps would accomplish that so this is called a an automatic um hopper self-dumping hopper it's called and the prices on there are, I wouldn't really go by that. They uh, range from two to 6,000 pounds. The um, cubic yards differ. The cost of the same thing with the, um, the previous container, the cost of shipping them to our location was high. Uh, but once that's done, that's done. 
So that was the other um, thing we were we were thinking of, and that all depends on local zoning. So we'll have to figure out that piece before we can decide um, which way to go. Um, so finish with the slides. That's all I've got for those things. Um, we talking about bears. Oh, those aren't mine, but they're nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had bears come to the transfer station at both the food scrap bay and our compactor. And we had bears squeeze into a closed compactor. It's probably an 18 inch opening. They squeezed in there. We had um, people from the forest department come and they tried lots of things. One of the things was rubber bullets. And so if they hit the bear with the rubber bullets, the bear would run off, stop, turn around and come back. So that wasn't effective. They suggested putting up a board with nails sticking out, which was tried. We know that the bear came because there were spots of blood around. We didn't like the idea of injuring the bear either. What finally worked for us was an electric wire across both the, where the compactor is and the food um, tote bay. And we um, primed it with a little bacon grease. And um, once the bears touch that with their nose or their mouth, it's much more effective than grabbing it with their paws. And they don't come back. We had two families with three babies in our area that was reported in many, many, many houses around the area, um, but they never came to the transfer station. But a word of caution, the bears are smart. They will come back if you do not activate your electric wire at the end of the day and they come once and find that, oops, you didn't put it on, they'll keep coming back and trying it. So that was uh, an important piece to pay attention to. Esther, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I, I love that. Well, I, I don't love the troubles you've had with bears, but I love the detail you provided there. Um, thank you. We'll, um, so folks who are listening, if you have questions for any speakers or, or other general questions or problems you're having, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try and get there um, to the chat in a little bit. Um, Susan Alexander, can I ask you to share from Lamoille Regional Solid Waste Management District your experiences? Um, and expertise. And maybe Susan, you're on mute still. Let me see if I. I can't seem to unmute you if you're muted. You missed my really good joke. Sorry, I won't repeat it. Anyway, <laughs> the Lamoille Solid Waste District had no uh, infrastructure, no collection of food scraps at their depots prior to Act 148. And um, we took it, took it on ourselves pretty seriously because we knew we could collect food scraps really well, but we had no option for um, transporting or processing them other than to build our own facility. So um, with a lot of uh, resources, intensive resources and time uh, and money, we um, really branded an entire program around food scrap collection. And for those of you who don't have that luxury of kind of operating and owning the whole system, um, you're, you're gonna be somewhat at the mercy of the folks who are, who are collecting your food scraps um, from your transfer station and or processing them. But because we control uh, the collection, the transport, and the processing, we really um, wanted it to be a, a significant program that engaged the community and that they identified it with us. Um, so, you know, here we are, step one. We we sell, like many of you, the kitchen collector and the food scrap um, bucket so that from beginning in your kitchen, we're helping you manage your food scraps all through the process. Um, so this is step one. Step two, we can go ahead, um, you know, you um, then bring that to our facility um, where we collect food scraps. At the time, we are aggregating them all in 48-gallon uh, totes, as you can see there. Um, flip forward. Um, there we go. 
And then we had a really rudimentary um, process for transporting them on a small trailer. And we had these T-bars for tipping, which um, worked fine for the beginning when we only had a few totes every week. Uh, slide. And then, of course, you had to tip and wash those and then return them to um, our facility. Uh, go forward, slide. So um, here's, here's what happened pretty quickly is that we were getting um, a lot of totes and we were worried about our employees' health and safety. Uh, tipping those totes on a little T-bar like that is great if you're doing a few, but as the numbers increased, we realized quickly we needed to uh, use some mechanical advantage here and we used the original infrastructure grant to purchase this tipper. Okay, go ahead, slide. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, our tote count went from, you know, a few totes a week to, I think at one point at this late summer and fall, we were bringing in 60, 70, maybe even more totes every week. And that's a lot of tote tipping and washing, even with a mechanical advantage, it's very time consuming. We were running our trailer back and forth a couple of times a week. So um, we started looking at uh, different opportunities to um, maximize time and efficiencies. And this is Black Dirt Farms uh, trailer and tipper that they've been using for years and years. As you can see, they got a little candy cane tipper on it with a tote. And that we looked at their their uh, operation and we thought that 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 worked pretty well but we decided to modify it a little bit to meet our own uh, needs go have go ahead and go forward so here you can see we've purchased a dump trailer um, and it's got a, um, a watertight seal gasket that fits in the back there and another tote tipper and that's just um, a demonstration of how it would work go forward a slide and then what we did is um, one of the things we learned from Black Dirt was having a fixed mounted candy cane tipper only allowed for tipping into that one back corner of their um, dump trailer. And so things tended to kind of fall into a nice pyramid underneath where it was tipping. And there was a large area of the trailer that wasn't really being used well. And that meant having to get in there and kind of move materials around and evening out the load. So we retrofitted our trailer with um, a top from an old recycling box. So it's got eight doors, four on either side. So we can move that tipper up and down and on either side so that we can be filling um, that as, as, e as efficiently as possible without creating little pyramids, especially that freeze up in the winter time. Um, and also because we wanted um, to just be able to manage moisture and um, cover uh, discrete areas of the food scraps um, at the end of a hot August day with the right amount of um, sawdust and not have to worry about being able to get it back in the back sides of the trailer. So um, that's our new system and we're looking to, uh, I think the gasket was being put in yesterday, the watertight gasket was being put in um, yesterday, will be deployed I think sometime next week. So we're really excited to see how that works, but we believe it'll cut down considerably hours and hours of labor um, being able to dump one trailer load of food scraps that might have, you know, um, a week's worth of totes in it rather than Hand, um, hand tipping and washing something like 60 or 70 totes. And we expect that number to be going up. We'll still keep our tote tipper up at Lamoille Soil where we process the material because we have customers, commercial haulers who bring us uh, food scraps and totes. And, so we, and, and we also use it for one of our other facilities, uh, which is adjacent to Lamoille Soil. So um, with regards to contamination, I think you can go forward now. Um, you know, we took it very seriously from day one that um, contamination would be a, a real problem for people in this area who weren't used to hauling food scraps. And um, we used a, you know, multimedia approach from, you know, brochures and displays and training sessions um, to, to help people understand that the only thing that we were going to collect, keeping our hands really tight on those reins, was food scraps. We didn't want any plastics. We didn't want any um, compostable serveware. 
um, go forward one. I think there's some more contamination there. Yeah, even PLUs, um, you know, we had a big PLU campaign, uh, which we just ended trying to convince people to tear those off. So, um, you know, sort of our strategy was that if we were really strict up front, it would be easier over time to allow different materials, such as compostable serveware, to be collected. Um, rather than opening the floodgates wide to start with and then having to, um, you know, change the public's um, perception and mind. So um, even with a really tight rein on, of course, we get plastic bags and, and bio bags and compostable silverware from time to time. But overall, I'd have to say our contamination levels from customers is pretty low. And then, of course, food scraps and, and vectors go hand in hand. We were talking a little bit about bears. And um, this was a picture that a, a customer sent us of those nice, heavy-duty plastic um, uh, buckets that we have are so proud of our screw-top lids. You know, you can't get those off. A bear can't unscrew them. But obviously, a bear found another way to get into that bucket. So um, we did have a problem this summer for the first time at our stove facility with bears. Um, the first time they were noticed, there was a couple of cubs climbing a tree adjacent to our facility, which just happened to be a restaurant that was doing outdoor dining for the first time. And a lot of restaurants were doing outdoor dining in stove for the first time because of COVID. So um, lots of food scraps outdoors, lots of French fries and things being left on the ground at these outdoor dining areas. And of course, we were collecting a lot more food scraps. So we um, did exactly what Esther ended up doing. I think the next slide shows, uh, I don't have a great picture of it, but this is basically a very simple solar charger that we wired up and strung wire all the way around our um, our tote trailer we were, that we were using at the time. And, um, you know, it took a couple of days for the bears to get the message, again, using the peanut butter and tin foil and, you know, kind of coaxing them in and then having them realize that, um, you know, getting that current on their nose or their mouth was uh, an unpleasant experience. And so that that worked fairly well throughout the summer. And of course, locking your totes, as John mentioned, you know, zip zip ties is what we use generally um, is is really helpful for things like um, raccoons as well. And then, you know, one of the other challenges we've had with vectors, we talked about um, the larva and the maggots. But in the next slide, you'll see um, I think it's the next one. Yeah, at our facility, we actually just started having a rat issue this year for the first time. Um, we've been collecting trash at transfer stations for 30 years, and I've never really had a significant um, rodent problem. And this year at our composting facility, we had um, a robust population of rats visiting us pretty regularly. So we've done everything from setting traps to having um, our employees who, who like to shoot guns uh, come in and, and use a variety of methods to try and um, eliminate some of them that way. And we're currently um, considering a, a chemical program as spring comes, uh, seeing how effective we are at, at switching up baits, setting traps regularly, and monitoring their activity. Um, but we may find that we need to uh, actually employ some type of a chemical program um, and perhaps doing that in conjunction with our neighbors up there, because we do have a neighbor nearby that is a trailer park that has had a rat problem for years, and they actually have a regular rodent control program that they use. So if we, we thought if we did it at the same timing this spring, that might be a little bit more effective. But uh, rats are pretty... Um, pretty amazing at how quickly they can reproduce. I think it's like every 28 days and they can have litters of like 10 to 12 animals. So it's very, very difficult once you have them to get it under control. So that's it. That's what I have to offer. Susan, thank you. Um, Certainly. Esther, you have a question? You're on mute, so you want to unmute yourself. Well, I actually had a question, but I wanted to add some information about the um, electric wires that we put up for the bears. Um, we already had power going to the site and receptacles at both the compactor and the bay where we collect food scraps. 
It took about 45 to 60 minutes to install all that, and the cost was a little over $800. Excellent. Thank you. So I did want to ask Susan a question. Is it now a good time? Sure, sure. Yeah, one question would be good, and then we'll go to our last speaker. Go ahead. Susan, I wonder if you can explain, first of all, is there a water source at your facility? And can you tell me what that mechanism is that you were washing your bins out with? Yes, we have water at both our stove facility where we collect most of our um, food scraps as well as at Lamoille Soil. And it's, um, you know, it's a hot water, high pressure washing system. Um, I think it's probably about a thousand dollars. I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head, but um, at Stowe, we just have a regular hose and we're going to put on a smaller high pressure water system. Doesn't need to be hot water because we'll probably be doing a lot of that inside because we have inside space for that trailer. But the one at Lamoille Soil is hot water to get those um, toadsicles out of the out of the totes and it, and at Stowe the totes will be dumped every day whereas the ones we are taking up to Lamoille Soils many of them were sitting for a full week so at Stowe they'll be um, dumping those one or two times a day depending on how much comes in and they can be quickly rinsed out and put right back into um, you know right back into work again so great Susan thank you so much um and I'm going to go to the last speaker, um, Josh Tyler from Chittenden Solid Waste District. Um, and folks, feel free to put any questions in the chat, and we'll do. We'll really start opening things up after Josh goes. He's our last speaker. Thanks a lot, Josh. Um, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, so I'm Josh Tyler. I'm the director of operations for the Chittenden Solid Waste District. Um, in regard to facilities and organics collection, we have uh, Green Mountain Compost, which is located in, in Williston, Vermont. Um, it's currently on place to collect about 6,400 tons this year of food scraps. Um, we have seven um, satellite or remote facilities that collect uh, food scraps, garbage recycling, and a whole host of other uh, materials. Um, but all seven do collect food scraps, and, and we've been doing that for about seven years or so now. Um, those those facilities themselves generate about 40 tons a month, so we're a little under 500 tons a year from our own internal facilities. And um, it has picked up, that's 40 tons in, in rising. Um, and that's with the uh, enactment of Act 148. Um, we started out and we currently are collecting food scraps in 65 gallon um, tippers um, or toters. Um, we estimate those are about 200 pounds each. Um, all of our facilities, our seven facilities, uh, have uh, operators in them, so they continually manage those toters. But I would say uh, South Burlington and Essex have upwards of 40 65-gallon toters. Um, we have a third-party uh, service provider that picks them up for us, and they have uh, a large, you know, almost gar packer garbage truck. Um, and they've got um, a side tipper where they put two toters at a time, tie them together, then tip them. Um, our busier facilities have service twice a week. Um, that's beginning to get uh, a little labor intensive. Uh, it's it's really kind of, you know, they service us while we're open sometimes. Um, so it gets in the way of, of our customers coming through and just it, it is it's getting labor intensive. So a couple of internal thoughts that we've developed. Um, we have historically collected material at our compost facility as well. And we had a station where people could pull up in Williston and uh, just drop their material off. We also were taking those in 65 gallon toters and realizing that's a lot of manual labor. Um, the way we used to handle it was we'd once those were full, we'd load put those on a loader, a front end loader, um, a pretty good size one. I think it has a 15,000 uh, or a 15 ton capacity for lifting. Um, we'd run over our scale to kind of track the amount of material that we were collecting. It got to a point where we were, we were servicing those three to four times a day. Um, so it just, you know, it pushed us to think of a better option. So what you're seeing in front of you now is um, it actually hooks into that front end loader. The the picture on the right, that's the uh, coupler setting. Um, and really what it gets placed, uh, it originally started at our compost facility. It's set on the ground. It has three service stations that you can see there. Those are you know latching lids. Um, and as it gets full, it, it's estimated to take about four yards of food scraps. 
um, the full design is for seven, but it never gets that full. It has been already indicated that, you know, food waste kind of develops a cone. Um, so we service that roughly one and a half, one and a half days um, to take it to get full. Uh, till it gets full, we'll, we'll drive over in our loader, we'll hook into it and we'll dump. Now, I guess let me back up. When we, we shifted our collections from our organics, um, our composting facility down the road to our Williston drop-off center because we had some congestion issues. Um, we were getting a lot of people in to drop off food scraps only, and it was actually getting in the way of the composting operations. So um, we've actually shifted that, that service down the road. Um, and that's where we service these. Um, we've got two down there. We service them about every one and a half days, um, just depending on how busy we get and what time of type, what day of the week it is. Um, so that's that's kind of our internal thought on how we do that. It's it's efficient. It's working well. Um, this is fabricated through a company that that generates these sorts of things. It's it's a rock company. Um, the other thing we're looking at, which I think is the next picture you might have, Josh. Um, we are looking due to the fact that it's you know we're we're getting service twice a week and we're we're moving upwards of twenty to thirty sixty five gallon toters twice a week. Um, we're looking at an internal haul versus getting a third party vendor. So one of the things we've researched is how to develop a container that um, can service our seven facilities um, and isn't too large, is robust enough to hold any liquid. Um, and it's something that we can get in and service relatively easy because the one thing we've realized at our sites is that um, it, it's about twice a week service. You need you can't let these things sit more than two or three days. Uh, it, they get odorous in the summer and they freeze in the winter, um, which is a common theme that we've heard as far as winter winter um, operations go. But this particular uh, container is roughly eight foot wide by ten foot long. Um, we're going to use one of our old dump trucks and turn it into a hook truck, uh, which which will be the vehicle that picks this thing up. Um, it'll have six service stations, so those little squares you see on it, those are areas that people will will use to dump material. It's about four feet off, three and a half feet off the ground, um, which is about the height of our 65-gallon uh, toters. This is, a, this is a prototype. We are in the process of getting this built. Um, we had to, had to walk the line of a complete fabrication job for one of these containers, which is pretty expensive to kind of matching what a roll-off truck would use. So that's why this is so big. I don't ever imagine we're going to use the full volume of this because we're going to have to service as, as often. But this is the thought is this will replace 30 65 gallon toters on our site. Um, some sites will have two. Um, so we're in the process of purchasing two of these to, to do a demo at our facility at our facilities in the spring. Um, and if it works, we'll we're going to purchase upwards of 12 to 14. Um, so we can do swaps, uh, and the idea behind that is in the winter, if things freeze, we can put them in a garage and thaw them out over a day and then bring them in. Um, as far as odors go for us, uh, we we actively have operators at all of our sites. We have uh, wood chips available for all of our customers. Our customers are really good about applying wood chips because nobody, <laughs> if you open one of our toters now and you get hit with a you know a bunch of flies and some smell, you're pretty quick to throw some wood chips on it. Um, and our, like I said, our operators go around and just make sure they're well maintained. Food scraps are sloppy though. So they're, you know, it's not perfectly clean. Um, this application will have the same concept. We'll have um, kind of a wheelbarrow of wood chips next to it and people can apply as liberally as they want. Uh, through the process, and it's really just going to be a trial and error at that point um, to see, you know, how often we service, how much we can get in there, when it freezes, when it stinks. Um, the 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 prototype we're purchasing does have an internal liner to mitigate any freezing and also to mitigate any leakage. Um, and it's uh, the the back side of it is a swing open door. Um, so the idea is, you know, the hook truck will pick it up. It'll it'll bring it to our tip floor at our compost facility. It'll you know put it at an angle and shake it um, with the back door open. So um, if the material is frozen, but not completely frozen, the liner should help keeping things from getting stuck inside. And then at our compost facility, we do have a pressure washer station um, that we've put into place, you know, to, to help this, you know, help clean these out as they come through. Um, so that's kind of our, our, our newest initiative right now, because we are hitting the point where the, the 65 gallon toters is just too many of them. The, the management side of it is taking up more time than, you know, than we feel it should. 
So we're, we're trying this. And again, the original picture you saw, that's that that works really well if you've got a compost facility on site or really close because you have to you have to move those things around with a loader. Um, but those work really well as, also. And we've received some pretty good uh, feedback from our customers as they come through. Um, as far as vectors go, all of our sites are, are fenced in. So we don't we don't see a lot of we don't see a lot of, you know, bears. I mean, we're in pretty urban areas, so bears aren't really a concern. Raccoons can be. Um, but like I said, um, these this picture here, you can see that they latch down. Um, but even our 65 gallon toters, we haven't had a lot of you know raccoons interacting with our our food scraps, which is which has been nice. Um, we don't have a we don't have too much of a rat issue either at our sites. So that's that's pretty much how we're managing this. We're kind of stepping into a new stage of maybe internal hauling versus having a third party hauler. Um, and seeing how that works for us. And, and the idea of internal hauling gives us the flexibility to pull when we need to. Um, and when, you know, if something comes up. So that's, that's, that's where we're at. Josh, thank you. Um, uh, th uh, special thanks to all of our speakers for sharing just your experiences, your knowledge, your, your photographs. Um, really, really helpful. Um, folks who may have questions for speakers or have a question for anyone, feel free to raise your hand and then I can call on you and you can actually just unmute yourself. There's about 33 of us still on the call, the 35 at the height, um, but I have a feeling somebody's got a question out there. So let me pause and see if there's questions. Ham had a question for Susan. Ham, you wanna just ask it? Or I can read it. Um, he's wondering, do you provide drop off as well as curbside collection? Yeah, so um, all we have is drop off. The, we have six facilities, Stowe being our largest one. It's open six days a week. We don't offer any type of curbside collection. However, we have seen three or four new haulers um, start businesses last year. Uh, going around and collecting curbside for both residents and commercial customers. Um, a couple of them had delivered to us and some take it back to different facilities. Uh, I think a lot of them statewide have started and they're all sort of feeling their way through this very marginal business where you can make money um, picking up food scraps and hauling them because unless you control more parts of the system, it's very expensive service to provide and you have to then pay a tipping fee. Um, you know, right now it, it seems to be working very well. Um, we don't ever really envision getting into the curbside business. Great, thanks Ham for that question. Um, Hannah, I think you have your hand up. Hannah Tyler. Yeah, so I was just wondering what um, other transfer stations are doing, maybe some of the smaller ones. Um, it's great to hear some of the bigger operations who have connections with compost facilities or who are composting on their own, but um, we don't quite have that resource yet in Hartford and we're we're getting really inundated with food scraps. And um, right now, the only option that we've been able to find that's affordable for us and, and reasonable with regards to like labor and the existing infrastructure we have is to have Casella haul that for us. And um, we're, uh, we're kind of struggling a little bit. So I was just gonna offer, I don't know, I, this question came up earlier today that people were asking, uh, who charges for their food scraps and we do charge our customers to drop off those food scraps um, because there's a huge cost to managing them as you just saw some of those big pieces of equipment um, so I don't know if that's an option uh, we also have one facility in in Worcester Vermont which is a very small facility it's only open on Saturday mornings for a few hours where we collect food scraps, of course, but we contract that out because geographically it's very difficult to get there from here and it costs us more time and in, in labor and wear and tear on vehicles to run down and pick up those food scraps um, than it does to hire a local hauler to come in and take them. Oh. 
Oh. Go, go ahead, Esther. Yeah. So we are a small facility also, Hannah, and we um, have Casella pick up our totes. The reason we wanted to go to those bigger containers, sorry. The reason we wanted to go to, <laughs> they're very persistent. <laughs> The reason we wanted to go to the bigger containers, I'm so sorry, um, was because we were finding that we needed greater than a one week, a one time per week pickup. Um, so the larger container, that, that gigantic 14 yard container would have allowed us to have a pickup every three to four weeks. And the reason for it being waterproof or wet um, ready is so that it could be closed, kept closed, um, only when we were dumping those smaller totes in, which we still plan to use, but we won't have to have as many in that in that bay. And that would save haul costs, which which are pretty pricey. Thanks for that detail, Esther, and and Hannah. Thanks for raising. Um, your your inundations, I, and I've certainly heard that word used by others, like a lot of material coming in. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, I just was going to ask Esther, but I see she had to pick up the phone. Um, but I'll just throw it out there for anyone, which is um, three to four weeks worth of food scraps seems like um, a problem waiting to happen. And I'm just going to throw it out there if anybody has any experience with food scraps staying in a container that long. That sounds like a long time to me. This is Dan Goosen, Green Mountain Compost. Um, we, I think the most we ever receive is occasionally we'll have a hauler bring in something that was at an event and maybe took them several days to pick up, but I'd say anything over a week, but, you know, depending on the time of the year, in the winter, in the, in the shoulder months, it might, you might be able to get away with two or three, but I would, I'm, I'd be, I'm very happy not to be on the receiving end of something that's been sitting there longer than that because I think you're gonna it's gonna be not not fun uh, and you're gonna have a lot of odor. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Dan. We do find with thawing totes um, at some facilities that when things thaw, they can create quite an odor, especially if the the material has sat sat for a while pr prior to arrival. Um, and it makes that hard for the composters to manage that. Um, so it's this it's this tug between um, not having collection all the time because of the cost, but to having it um, collected so that you're meeting the demands of this material, this putrescible material, which we all know gets stinky very fast. Um, so that, that's why I'm I'm bringing these topics to the up to folks because maybe dumpsters can work, but they might not always be the solution. Um, Ham Gillett, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. I do. Uh, Susan, I'm going to direct this to you, but it's really to uh, uh, everybody. Did you start out charging from the very start or did you, was your collection, your drop off, was it free to begin with? I'm wondering about people who start off not charging and then feel that they have to start charging and what effect that has with your customers. Yeah, yes, to answer your question, we did start right away charging a dollar a bucket. And uh, we looked at, around at some of our neighbors and what they were doing, and not everyone was doing that. But again, we thought that going from charging to not charging, if our balance sheet worked out that way, was a lot easier and a easier pill to swallow than um, char uh, not charging and then having to raise the rate on it, the price on it. Um, I would have to say we have had quite a bit of um, feedback from our customers who say, wait a minute, I'm bringing you a five gallon bucket and, I'm, and you're charging me a dollar. And then when I come and pick up a five gallon bucket of compost, you're charging me for that as well. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of learning for people to understand that, um, you know, a dollar a bucket is covering a, a small portion of the overall expense and that you know we it's more than just collecting it and getting it off site it then has to be processed and made into compost and then packaged and sold back to the customer so um 
Yeah. It's it's it's, so, it's not a it's not a business that I would encourage anyone to get into lightly because it is a very very thin margin with the best situation and the best management and the most efficient systems. Um, it's it's difficult. So that's my two cents or dollar a bucket. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And if I could jump in also just. Uh, uh, critical mass also isn't is helpful either, you know, which is why we're shifting to a different container style because we do have such a large volume coming through. But our hauling fees that we're paying right now will be north of one hundred thousand dollars this year. So, you know, that that puts the margins into perspective. Um, those con prototype containers I showed you are about eight thousand dollars. We hope to get that down, you know, once we kind of figure out our our what we want and how we want it. We're kind of in the in the discovery phase, but. Um, and also converting our, our our old dump truck to a to a uh, a hook truck is about forty thousand dollars. So you know our ROI is is going to be achieved relatively quickly, but it's not as Susan said, it's <laughs> very thin margins. And we do charge a dollar a five gallon bucket as well. We didn't originally. We instituted that a couple of years ago, um, and uh, it wasn't received well for the exact same reasons that Susan brought up. Um, so it's you know it's. It's it's just it's a very tight margins when collecting this material. Thanks, Josh. Tom Kennedy, go ahead. OK, that's actually Mary O'Brien using Tom Kennedy's computer. Um, so Susan, I want to ask you before you get into a chemical solution uh, for the for the uh, the rats, I'm wondering it, this sounds maybe too wild, but relocating a colony of feral cats that have been um, spayed and neutered to that site. Have you considered that? Um, actually, it's a great idea. We hadn't considered the cat option, um, although I just, my son just te texted me from Puerto Rico saying that there are no rats on the island because there's so many feral cats. So that did <laughs> pop into my mind lately. Uh, but we also were we were also given guidance from a compost operator um, to perhaps get a couple of rat terrier dogs because they apparently are very good at getting rid of rats. So um, we haven't gone that route. It's a very delicate topic to have a discussion about, and it can be very um, visceral in terms of you know how we um, kill these animals because. Just like Esther was saying, you know, the idea of a bear stepping on a, a board that has nails in it, it you know, it, it hits you in that part of your brain that you have a reaction to. Um, rats, maybe less so, but even still, I have a very hard time asking my employees to kill animals. Um, so maybe the maybe the cats and dogs are a less offensive approach. I don't know, but that's not a bad idea. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Mary, any other question you had? No, okay. Other questions? Or best practices? Yeah, Joyce, go ahead. I have a question for Josh. Um, that three bin dumpster that you have, how does that tip out? I saw the yellow uh, bars that I guess you hook onto. Does that tip out of the three receptacles on top or how does that tip out? Um, so the 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 other side, the front, so you, you hook the 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 loader in, you know, um, the tipping part of the loader into where those hooks were. And so the the actual bucket the point of the bucket is out in front and it's it's hinged um so there's a there's actually a roof on it that's hinged so when you when you lift it up and you and you dump it the hinged part of the roof comes up and all the material slides out um yeah i've got a couple extra schematic pictures which might make it helpful but it's 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 a uh, it's like a large it's like a large um bucket on a loader except with a cover on it um, so, and, and with the, and with a pretty robust hinging system. 
if that that hopefully I <laughs> explained it <laughs> well enough. Yeah, thank you. No problem. All right, let's go to Ham Gillett, then we'll go to Athena. I'm back on the rats again. <laughs> uh, Susan, just to let you know, rat terriers kill rats really fast. It's like almost like getting killed in a trap. Um, they're not like cats, which are very cruel, um, but they basically just snap the neck and it's gone. I lived on a horse farm for a while. We had two uh, Jack Russell Terriers and they would just go into the barn and uh, do their, not, not do their business in the regular way, do their rat business really fast. So just wanted to throw that out there. Good to know. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Athena, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, for Josh. Actually, my first question was answered, but I also wanted to know the approximate cost of your um, dumpster, uh, what you do with the forklift, and also that that weight of the four cubic yards, if you put that in there, that doesn't get too heavy for the front loader, huh? No, the, the front loader can hold about uh, handle about 15 tons, well, okay. one five, 15 tons, um, 30,000 pounds. Um, and uh, say this, I'm sorry, I just, uh, first question one more time. Uh, approximate cost of those. Oh, Dan, I think 4,800 was about uh, right. No, I was thinking, uh, I think there were 7,000, 6,000. Oh. They, they cost about a a thousand dollars to get shipped something like that so okay but they may they may have been like five thousand for fabri fabrication 5500 something like that plus a thousand and then we modified them when they arrived to put on the covers and the lids and uh, paint them so all in i think it was closer to seven or eight per container bob down at wyndham Saldways has those uh, schematics all, that's okay and you guys have the same loader or he has the same loader yeah that we okay. use so um, and so they don't leak. There's no leachate that comes out of them, huh? No, they've sealed bottom, so it's just a metal sealed container on the bottom. And I mean, there's theoretically, if you got a lot of liquid in there as you're driving it around, you could have splashing. But no, they don't leak. Wow, great design. I might be able to share my screen, Josh Kelly, if that's okay. I'll, I, I've got a kind of a schematic design to show how it came. Yeah, that's that's fine. I don't know if Emma, we need to give permission for that, but let's see if you can do it. See what happens. Um, and where is it? It's in there. Yeah, sometimes you have to scroll way down to find what you're looking for. Nope, that's not what I want. Let's not do that. Oh, all right. Stop presenting. Okay, that went horribly. Um, let's see. Oh, there. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, <laughs> we'll do, okay, there it is. Let's see if this comes up. Let me know if you guys can see this. Yes. Yep. We see it. We see okay. It. So the hooks were on the back here, and that this this container is what came fabricated to us with a bottom. We made the lid for the top and we hinged it. Um, we didn't quite hinge it this way. We actually hinged it halfway through the top of it so we could put our containers, or, you know, our openings for our customers to come in and use. So we did have a little bit of steel and fabrication work um, that our maintenance crew put together, but they did a great job. So that's a, a little bit clearer of a picture of how it works, if that is helpful. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, I am realizing we're, we're just over the hour. I'm happy to stay on. Um, I want to, again, express my sincere gratitude to all of you, especially the speakers for sharing their perspectives and for everybody for joining this call and for all the work you do to collect food waste. Our goal is to collect it in an effective manner um, that both manages the material safely and also gives the customer a good experience. Um, a lot of that comes with your cost, your time, your hard work and um, and I sincerely appreciate that. Um, I think what we're trying to think about is any, again, just best practices that can be shared amongst facilities. If there's ever a time when you want to have a discussion like this on any solid waste topic, 
don't ever hesitate to ask the state to set up one of these. It's very easy for us reasonably. Um, we did record today's uh, presentations and, and, and session, um, and we did invite food scrap haulers. I don't, I can't quite see if anybody on the list jumps out to me as a food scrap hauler. There might be a few, um, but I do see a lot of facilities uh, folks in there, which is good. I'll give a, a pause for any other questions and then Emma and I, as a follow up, we will try and send this out as a link so if anybody who missed it can watch it. Um, if you want to email us questions that that uh, we could try and get answers to, you can email me or Emma on that. Um, and Alyssa Eichler on our team is taking some notes of the, the great ideas you guys have shared from the rat terriers to, uh, to great dumpster design. Let me pause here and see if any other last minute questions or uh, comments. Emma, did I miss anything in the chat? Nope. Josh, good. Josh Go ahead. I just say um, this is Eric Brown with compliance and uh, I just wanted to say that it's so nice to hear what you guys are uh, doing as far as troubleshooting and adapting to both the needs of the regulations and to the customer base. I think that's uh, it's really nice to be on this side to to listen to that discussion and and have you um, brainstorm ideas of of how to implement different practices and different technologies to make it work. So as always, I look forward to getting out to your facilities and and seeing some of these things in the works and um, hoping that it's a uh, it's a good spring to try out some of these things. So I'll be seeing you here pretty soon. And I again, I really appreciate being on the call uh, and just hearing um, from you all. So thanks for sharing so much. Thanks, Eric. Um, Cassie uh, Wolfanger is uh, Cassandra Wolfanger with ANR DEC is also with us. Um, Cassie, anything you wanted to share? Feel free to pipe in. I didn't want to um, bowl over anybody. No, that's OK. I would just echo what Eric said. Thanks for the perspective of what you deal with every day and um, just happy to hear what it's like and looking forward to seeing some of these facilities in person. I know that you all work really hard, so thank you for what you do. Thanks, Cassie. Um, I will uh, leave you with a little parting joke in my house, which is my kitchen countertop compost uh, bucket that I use. I don't, I will admit to this audience only, I don't wash it out very often. And my wife would like me to wash it out much more often than I do. But I, as a tip, I put sometimes a handful of finished compost into it and I just kind of shake it around. And I am still to this day amazed at how that absorbs odor by itself. Um, so keep that as a tip. You, use finished compost um, in your toters to absorb odor. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always amazed by compost and its powers. Um, Dan Goosen knows this probably more than, than, than I, certainly more than I do. Um, and uh, I just appreciate the sharing of information. And again, if you want us to do one of these again, um, or on any topic uh, from recycling to household hazardous waste, um, sometimes we get questions on oil management. Um, we're, we're always happy to do that, um, to try and serve you better and serve the people of Vermont better. So thanks again, folks, and um, I will uh, sign off and wish you all a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>